Good afternoon and welcome to the Zuckerman Museum of Art's last Wednesday lunch. I'm Elizabeth Thomas, the Education and Outreach Coordinator here at the museum. We're really glad that you've joined us. Thank you for coming. Today we're going to be hearing from Kyle Holland, but first I'd like to tell you a little bit about the exhibition that his presentation is coordinating with. So we are here in the Fine Arts Gallery in an exhibition called In Conversation, The Fluid and the Concrete by Cynthia Norris Thompson. Let me give you a quick look around. For this exhibition, we have cases of handmade books in the gallery. The books on display here were all created at Dudonet Press. On April 14th, we have Sue Gozen who is the president and creator of Dudonet Press, who will be joining us to talk about the exhibition and the books that she's created with the artist who came to work with her. These books span about 20 years of creation. They include Leslie Dill with poetry by Tom Slay, Jane Hammond with poetry by Raphael Rubinstein, William Kintridge with poetry by Wislawa Zimborska, Abby Lee with writings by W.H. Auden, Michelle Okadonner with her own writing, Mark Strand with his own writing and imagery, Eliza Kentridge with her own writing and imagery, and work by Anne Vilsboyle and Sue Gozen with the poem Unending Love by Rabindranath Tagore. We're really excited to have these books on display for one more week. The exhibition will close next Wednesday in the evening at five. And at seven, we're going to be having two local poets of international renown, Ilya Kaminsky and his wife, Katie Ferris, join us at the Legacy Gazebo for a reading of their work. That will happen at seven o'clock PM. We hope that you'll have the chance to come join us there. Next week, we also have a presentation that's related to handmade paper and book arts. We have Brian Queen of Calgary, Canada, who will be talking about his work um, using 3D printing to create um, watermarks in paper. And at this point, let me introduce you to our guest speaker today. It's going to be Kyle Holland, who you see prominently on your screen. Kyle is a visual artist who was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. He earned his BFA in fine arts with a concentration in printmaking from Memphis College of Art in 2012. He received his MFA in Book Arts and Printmaking from the University of the Arts in Philadelphia in 2019. His work has been exhibited internationally in notable group exhibitions, including Psych Land, Far Contemporary Gallery, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and the Hall Gallery in the Wingate Visual Arts Center at Millsaps College, Jackson, Mississippi. Masters of the Contemporary Print, Towson University, Towson, Maryland, more Than Surface Contemporary Prints on Handmade Paper at the Robert C. Williams Museum of Papermaking in Atlanta. Then and Now, 10 Years of Residencies at the Center for Book Arts in New York, New York, and Castle Gallery at the College of New Rochelle. No Man is an Island, the Masculine Landscape in the 21st Century, Printmaking Center of New Jersey, Branchburg, New Jersey, and fifth international artist book exhibition, King Street Stephen Museum in Hungary. His work is held in the collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Nevada Museum of Art, the Center for Book Arts, Yale University, Rhode Island School of Design, and University of California, Berkeley, among others. Holland has been an artist in residence under the Scholarship for Advanced Studies in Book Arts program at the Center for Book Arts. That was in 2012. And his work has been featured in portfolios, including Negative Space and Handmade Paper, Picturing the Void, published by Hand, Make, Hand Paper Making 2014, Surface Tension, The Barren, The Despondent, and The Void, a portfolio organized and curated for the 2018 SGC International Conference, and Extra Pulp, a portfolio organized by IS Project of handmade paperworks by papermakers who utilize paper as its own form of expression, 2019. Holland is currently an instructor and studio manager for the MFA Book Arts Program at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. Thank you so much, Kyle, for coming to be with us today. Turning it over to you. Thank you, Elizabeth, and welcome to those of you who are joining us this afternoon. 
I am just going to share my screen because I have pre recorded my lecture for this afternoon. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me for my last Wednesday lunch lecture, Transmuted Objects and Activated Materials, in association with the exhibition In Conversation, The Fluid and the Concrete, which is currently on display at the Zuckerman Museum of Art until April 9th. I will be discussing the field of contemporary book arts as it relates to the disciplines of letterpress printing and hand paper making. I will be presenting several of my own works and works by other artists that activate handmade paper as a substance and substrate by creating physical connections to place or by recycling objects that have memories, stories, and experiences associated with them into paper. Before I present works by contemporary artists who are approaching the discipline of hand paper making through a critical lens, I would like to start by providing an overview of the papermaking process and introducing a few individuals and technological advancements that led to the shift in the cultural significance of handmade paper on a global scale. On this slide is an illustration depicting the process of producing paper by hand by Mae Babcock of paperslittery.com. To begin this process, raw material that has cellulose content such as cotton, linen, or even hemp rags, plants, or paper must be collected or harvested. Rags and plants typically need to be cooked with alkalis such as wood ash, slaked lime, soda ash, or lye to dissolve non-cellulosic impurities like lignin, pectin, waxes, and gums, which allows the fiber to break down during the beading process. The Hollander beater, which was developed by the Dutch between 1630 and 1665, is the most versatile piece of equipment that can be used to beat cellulose fiber into pulp. Prior to the invention of the Hollander beater, stampers and wooden mallets were used to beat fiber into pulp. After pulp has been beaten, a mold and decal, which is a flat sieve-like tool, is used to scoop pulp out of a vat that contains pulp and water of varying consistencies depending upon the thickness of the paper to be made. Once pulp is scooped from the slurry with the mold, water drains through the mesh while pulp begins to form hydrogen bonds as it randomly settles on the surface of the mold to form a wet, delicate sheet of paper. This sheet of paper is then transferred onto a piece of interleaving material such as a woven felt or pylon interfacing. After the desired number of sheets have been made, they are typically pressed in a hydraulic press to expel excess water from the sheets, which gives them enough integrity to be handled during the drying step. Drying is usually, but not always, the last step in the paper making process, and there are several ways that handmade sheets of paper can be dried, the most common of which is to dry wet sheets of paper in a restraint drying system. For this method of drying, wet sheets of paper are sandwiched between blotters, which are sandwiched between triple wall corrugated cardboard. Once all of the paper is stacked in this manner, a significant amount of weight is placed on top and air is forced through the stack of cardboard with a fan that is positioned behind the entire assembly, resulting in handmade sheets of paper that are completely flat. After the craft of hand paper making reached Europe, paper mills struggled to collect rags and produce paper at the rate that would meet the needs of book publishers. Eventually, this led to the invention of the Forgerneer machine, which is pictured in this slide by Lewis Robert in 1799. Later in 1806, the design was improved and patented by Henry and Seeley Forgerneer in England. Unfortunately, the invention of the Forgerneer machine was one major factor in the declining prevalence of the craft of hand paper making, paper mills, and the use of handmade paper globally. Luckily, Dard Hunter revitalized interest in hand paper making traditions and paper's use as a substrate for printed matter in the US. He devoted a large part of his life to traveling the world to study paper making traditions and collect tools and artifacts related to such traditions, 
which are currently housed in the Robert C. Williams Museum of Papermaking at Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, Georgia. Douglas Morse Howell is equally as important to the current resurgence in the practice of an interest in hand papermaking as Dard Hunter. Howell is credited with revolutionizing the practice of hand papermaking and the cultural significance of handmade paper. The next four slides will exemplify Howell's thinking and approach to paper pulp as a creative medium rather than simply as a material with which sheets of paper can be made. By 1950, Howell began to develop techniques for creatively working with paper pulp on the surface of molds that he would float in vats. Each of the three techniques that he developed involve an element of controlled chance. Howell referred to these works that were created by embedding images directly into his papers and were therefore no longer ordinary paper papetries. For the papetry in this slide, which was created using the synchronic drawing technique, he encased a piece of thread between two sheets of paper. Then he filled in the majority of the areas enclosed by the threads with watercolor paint. To create the papetry in this slide, the fence and pour technique was used. With the mold floating in a vat, Howell arranged pieces of bent copper flashing that looked similar to cookie cutters and poured pulp into the copper flashing. When the copper flashing was lifted, an area of stenciled pulp in the shape of the copper flashing remained on the mold. Once Howell was satisfied with the composition, the mold would be lifted off of the surface of the water in the vat and gently shaken, not only to blend the edges of the shapes together, but also to even out the formation of the sheet. The third technique that Howell used to create his papetries was referred to as stopping out. This technique involved the use of templates, generally made out of wood, that would be placed on the surface of the mold to act as a stencil that would prevent pulp from settling on the surface of the mold as a sheet of paper was formed. Once a sheet of paper was formed, the template was removed to reveal an area on the surface of the mold where there was no pulp. This process was then repeated between two to five times with different templates and colors of pulp to create abstract painterly compositions in the papetries that were produced using the stopping out technique. While Howell's work, The Clown, chronologically preceded the papetries, it is important to preface the presentation of works by contemporary artists with this piece because it is presumably the first artwork that exclusively uses paper pulp in the creation of a recognizable image. This work more clearly represents a transition from paper's use as a substrate to the use of paper pulp as an artistic medium and the recognition of paper as a form of artwork in and of itself. One final individual who should be acknowledged for the current revitalization in hand paper making is Susan Gozen, co-founder of Dudenay Paper Mill and president of Dudenay Press. As an artist, educator, and collaborator, Sue has been a proponent of the experimental approach and creative, creative spirit that Douglas Morse Howell brought to the discipline of hand paper making. Sarika Sugla is a printmaker and papermaker who currently lives in Brooklyn, New York. In her piece, Viewfinder, pictured in this slide, the ubiquitous plastic six-pack ring is instantly recognizable. As a viewer, our attention is focused on it and it simultaneously obstructs and is framed by the water-inspired surface that lies beneath it, just as they are when they litter bodies of water. This piece was created by using a process called blowout. Developed at Dudenay, blowouts involve the use of stencils to cover up and protect portions of freshly formed sheets of paper while the exposed areas are slowly blown away by a fine mist sprayed from a hose. In this case, the plastic six-pack ring was used as a stencil to blow out a sheet of paper while it was still on the mold. Without lifting the plastic six-pack ring, the blown out sheet is then cooched on top of another sheet of paper thereby encasing the plastic six-pack ring between two sheets of paper and permanently ridding the environment of one piece of litter at a time through the creation of this addition. 
Ingrid Schindel is a printmaker and book artist based in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, who also founded a fine art print studio called IS Projects. Much like Sarika, Ingrid is also engaged with the environment around her as an active collaborator, and her work in handmade paper has most recently been created outside of a conventional papermaking workshop paradigm. To create the two works pictured in this slide, Ingrid traveled to beaches in Naples and Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where she pressed the damp sand until it was relatively flat and positioned a plastic nickel around the flat sand for use as a mold-like tool. Then she poured pulp onto the flattened sand, similar to the way in which Howell poured pulp onto his mold using his fence and pour technique and allowed the water to drain down into the sand, leaving a sheet of paper on the surface. These works are self portraits drawn by the shorelines, as well as documents and vessels that contain the sand, salt, and smells that were part of this process. This is a short two minute video that documents the creation of these works. Anna Tararova is a printmaker and papermaker who currently lives in Cleveland, Ohio. The pieces in this slide depict Moonville, a small coal mining town in southeastern Ohio that was abandoned in 1947. Anna hiked overgrown trails to visit Moonville, where she harvested plants to be processed into pulp for papermaking and to photograph the locations that the plants were harvested from. After preparing the pulp from the plants that were harvested, she relied on cognitive maps and her memory to recreate the color in the photographs that were taken by pouring pigmented pulp onto sheets of paper formed from the plants harvested. After the sheets of paper were dry, the photographs were then screen printed on top of the pulp painted sheets of paper. In the finished works, there are varying degrees of misregistration between the pigmented pulp and the photograph that's printed on the paper, illustrating the discrepancy between reality place, and memory. Text is often the starting point for Texas-based artist Dario Robledo, who writes what he refers to as liner notes, which include titles, captions, and lengthy lists of materials prior to creating each of his pieces. He solicits faith from the viewer that the bizarre materials he lists were truly used in the creation of his works. Robledo also engages in the act of collecting. However, he gathers materials that are used in sculptures and assemblages, which are created in an effort to heal the wounds of our collective past. This is evinced in his war series, which is comprised of works made between 2001 to 2010 and include the assemblages on this and the previous slide. 
As part of this series, Robledo created a fictional anonymous Civil War soldier who traversed historic American battlefields, sustaining physical and psychological wounds along the way. Robledo makes it easier to imagine the horrifying experience this fictional soldier and the very real soldiers had in the midst of and in the ap aftermath of war with pieces in this series. In both of these assemblages, Robledo has listed homemade paper as part of the liner notes. For the assemblage on the previous slide, the pulp was made from brides' letters to soldiers from various wars while the pulp was made from letters that soldiers sent home for the assemblage on this slide, demonstrating the ways in which Robledo imbues his materials and even the minutia of how they are manipulated with meaning. Now I would like to talk about several of my pieces that activate handmade paper as a substance and substrate by recycling objects that have memories and experiences associated with them into handmade paper. Both the history of my relationship with my father and my experience growing up in the American South have led me to believe that I must possess a certain set of qualities to be considered a man in the context of masculine culture. It seems that a man should be risk-taking and effortlessly exhibit strength, pride, confidence, and superiority. Men are pressured to assimilate this culture not only through standardizing their physical appearance, demeanor, and behavior, but also through sharing common interests and hobbies such as hunting or fishing. Judgment is the consequence of opposing this prototype in favor of one's own individuality. The artist's book on this slide, Birds of Prey, captures this feeling by depicting a journey through my psychological landscape. The feeling of being looked down on by other men is embodied by the vultures that loom and overshadow a deer, which appears vulnerable and skinless. The imagery in the book is accompanied by text that was excerpted from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein due to the resemblance between Victor Frankenstein's relationship with his creation and my relationship with my father. In Birds of Prey, Victor Frankenstein is the omniscient voice of the vultures and Frankenstein's monster gives voice to the deer. One of the reasons that it was important to produce Birds of Prey as a book was because it was developed as a reflection of my body. Just as one's consciousness has an interdependent relationship with one's physique, a book and its contents depend on its cover for protection. Leather was used as a covering material to correspond with my own skin and was cold tooled to figuratively represent the experiences that have scarred or otherwise left an impression on me, while the contents of the book address my psychological landscape as I navigated and continue to navigate hegemonic masculine culture in the South. While the trees in the forest are based on photographs of real trees, the compositions in the book are phantasmal and the use of pressure printing to depict these surroundings reinforces their unreal origins through the aura-like quality it imparts to the images. The deer throughout the book are armatures that were appropriated from taxidermy catalogs and were incorporated as self-portraits. Some of the vultures that loom, overshadow, and prey on the deer in the book are depicted with only contours, suggesting that in addition to verbal judgment, hegemonic masculine culture uses psychological means of manipulation to maintain a dominant social standing. In other words, identity is socially constructed by feeling like one is constantly being watched and judged. Throughout the book, the viewer slash reader shifts from being an observer to inhabiting the deer and seeing the forest from my perspective. Abridius was cho chosen as the typeface for the book due to its branch-like qualities, which are particularly apparent in the ascenders and descenders of some of the lowercase letters. The text was organized using an axial design system. The fold of the folios is used as the axis from which the text branches. Horizontal divisions, based on the first image in the book, which you can see in this slide, were used as an additional layer of structure to spatially arrange text. This slide shows a spread from the book with text that is organized on an axial design system. When considering the vertical axis along with the text itself, the asymmetric branching compositions begin to resemble trees. 
This is another spread from the book with text on it so that you have a chance to see it without the design system overlaid on top of it. The gray paper on which the last text from Victor Frankenstein's creation appears and the subsequent spread is made from camouflage cotton clothing. This is the part of Frankenstein when Victor Frankenstein's creation is deserted by his protectors, the de Lacy family, and leaves his hovel for Geneva, Switzerland. The reduction of the camouflage fabric into cool gray paper corresponds with Victor's Frankenstein's creation's lack of shelter, ability to blend in, and suffering of a cold winter, as well as my own inability to assimilate Southern masculine culture to blend in among my surroundings. This is a piece titled The Rake, for which I recreated a photograph originally taken by a trail camera of the rake. According to urban legend, the rake is said to be seen around the northeastern United States and will attack humans even if unprovoked. To be visited by the rake is an omen of personal tragedy. This is the original photograph that I recreated. For the past five years or so, I have been appropriating text from online hunting forums that primarily consists of anecdotes written by hunters who anonymously confess to having fearful experiences in the woods at night. The process of reading discussions on these forums allows me to enter a liminal virtual space from which I emerge along with these other men with whom I sympathize as an aggregate ambiguous identity. The text is limited to first person singular pronouns resulting in an authorial voice that is as much the original contributors as it is mine. This text was incorporated along with the photo that the rake was captured in, however, as a sympathetic gesture toward these men who share their fears in the online communities of hunting forums, the rake was removed from the image to make the woods less of a fearful place. An important consideration in the creation of this piece for me was why the medium of pulp was appropriate and how the fibers that I chose would tie in with the content of my work. A portion of the pulp used was beaten from Wrangler jeans, which I associate with men who embody the archetype of hegemonic masculinity, a dominant idealized man to which I and the men who, am, who publicly post about their fears on hunting forums fall victim to. Beating these articles of clothing into pulp and constructing a space from which frightening elements are removed is my subversive act against the social structure. On the left-hand side of this slide, you can see the thrifted pair of Wrangler jeans that I used in the creation of this piece. And on the right-hand side are the belt loops, seams, and hems cut into one-inch pieces to be beaten into pulp. On this slide, you can get a sense of how much transformation the Wrangler jeans and any other raw material that is beaten into pulp undergo from the state that they are in when they are collected or harvested to the state that they are in once they are finished being beaten in a Hollander beater. I would like to thank Cynthia Norse Thompson for the invitation to present this last Wednesday lunch lecture in association with the exhibition in conversation, the fluid and the concrete, and Elizabeth Thomas for generously hosting me. I would also like to thank everyone in the audience for taking the time out of your day to come to this lecture. I have included links to websites for each of the organizations and artists in this presentation in case anyone is interested in learning more. Thanks again. Kyle, wow, that was fabulous. Thank you so much. I feel like I learned quite a bit. Oh, good. I'm so glad to hear that. And I certainly enjoyed seeing artworks that I wasn't previously exposed to. Um, if there are questions, now would be a good time. You're welcome to unmute and ask them. I would like to better understand um, with your work, the Wrangler jeans, the camouflage pants, um, do you typically use recycled fabrics or do you have a wide variety of materials that you enjoy working with? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say that the, the pieces that I highlighted in my presentation that use the recycled fab fabrics are probably um, 
less common than other materials that I'll use in my process. Um, typically, I work with a material that is sort of half of the process that I sort of presented at the beginning of the presentation, um, which is a material called half stuff, um, which comes to me um, having had the collection and harvesting and cooking steps already done to it, and even uh, a degree of beading that's not as refined as I would like it to be for making sheets of paper from. Um, but what I'm able to do is cut out steps of the process that I would otherwise have to do with my recycled fabric materials. Um, and it kind of expedites the expedites the the creative process for me if I'm making a piece of artwork that doesn't require specifically selected recycled fiber. So I'm able to just take that half stuff material, soak it in water, tear it up, and kind of go directly to the beading process and skip everything that usually would come before that. Um, so th those are the things that I probably most commonly use, but um, occasionally then I also harvest my own plant fibers, um, which of course has to go through all the steps um, of that process that I showed at the beginning of the presentation. How, how long does it take you? How much time do you spend to create a book like the ones you showed? Um, Birds of Prey took a very long time, um, primarily because I wasn't completely and only devoted to the creation of it when it was conceived. Um, so I started um, conceptualizing and producing that book as a resident artist at the Center for Book Arts in New York City in 2012. And during that time frame, I had a year-long residency, which was very generous. Um, but I did need to support myself with other work um, in order to, to live in New York City throughout the, the duration of that residency. So it took longer than the period of my residency, which is not what I anticipated, but it, all in all, the creation of a book like that um, took five to six years, which is very atypical um, when you're kind of looking generally at how long it takes to create an artist's book. The time frame that most artists take is probably one to two years, um, which is more reflective of some of the other volumes that I have produced, but just not that one that I presented. Mm -hmm. And I, I know you work at the University of Alabama Tuscaloosa in the MFA program in book arts there. Um, I'm curious if you are aware of any trends or other innovations that you see coming out of, um, of the students that you work with? Yeah, um, I would say that what's most noticeable to me is um, students being more inclined to incorporate text in their work that isn't authored by themselves. Um, so they're kind of looking outside of themselves to pre-existing written material, whether that's prose or poetry, and finding a way to intervene with those texts um, to at least construe it in their own creations as at least partially their own. Um, they're not necessarily illustrating an author's writing, but they're they're kind of taking it and reconfiguring it creatively to to sort of at least partially have ownership or have some kind of participatory voice in uh, another author's writing. That is interesting because here in the in conversation, the fluid and the concrete exhibition, the artists have utilized others poetry, about half of the artists have used others poetry. And I don't think of it as illustration at all. I think of it more as a conversation with those words and their own response 
um, surrounding those words, that they, they present those words so that that conversation is made clear to the viewer, which is a very different thing than illustrating a book. Yes, right, right. And some of the artists here have worked collaboratively. Um, is that something that you see happening very often in the world of contemporary book arts? Yes. Um, I, in my experience, I would say that um, it's about half artists and individuals wholly taking on the production of, you know, something like an artist's book or another kind of creative book object and half, you know, artists and writers and, um, and you know, other creatively minded people, you know, getting together and working collaboratively. Um, that I see that represented in the faculty, even here at the university. Um, some of our students also um, take on those different kind of methodologies and approaches to book arts. Um, so in my experience, I would say that it, you know, it seems at the current time we're in right now that it's about half people um, like myself, where I'm, I'm just kind of doing all aspects of the creation and production of my work and then half um, individuals kind of working with collaborative teams or even just with two, two people that are working on the production of books. Well, it's a fascinating field that I've enjoyed learning more about and really appreciate you coming to share your expertise. Are there other comments that you would like to share before our time is over? Um, if people wanted to learn more where you might direct them or um, places to go perhaps in the country, like the Center for Book Arts, where you did your residency? Are there, are there places you think that people should know about? Um, sure. Um, well, there, there's, a, there's a good number of organizations around the country that, um, that specialize in various aspects of book arts. Um, the, I, I, of course, like to promote the ones that I've been involved with. Um, I would recommend to anyone visiting New York City to visit Dudenay Paper Mill if you have the opportunity to. Um, in Cleveland, Ohio, the Morgan Conservatory is there, um, which has a wide array of programming. They have an exhibition space and studio spaces that anyone can walk in and see. Um, there's also places in Minnesota and San Francisco. Um, so there's, um, there's just um, a lot um, of productivity and creativity going on in book arts around the U.S. and um, and internationally. So, um, but I would definitely suggest checking out some of those places that I listed. That sounds good. So thank you, everyone. I hope everybody has a marvelous rest of your day. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Elizabeth. You have a nice day too. Thank you. Bye.